Well, this is a very special episode of the Encounter Faith Podcast because I am sitting here with Jen Anderson. And Jen, you have the distinction of being the guest that I had to ask the most to join us. <laughs> and uh, But I'm glad, I'm glad we're doing this and I'm very glad you're here. Thank you for taking the time. Well, thank you for having me. I am actually very glad to be here. Um, <laughs> I was a little hesitant yeah. at first, but very glad to be here with you today. Here's why I think it, I was so excited to have you on. We've been in this Be The One teaching series, and it's been this really great way to bring this conversation that you care about, that I care about, that the people who have been on the podcast care about, but often aren't, often this conversation isn't in the center of the church. And I love the fact that we are able to like, bring this to the forefront for so many different people in so many different stages of life. But the thing that I feel like we've kind of kept coming up in these conversations or even hearing these conversations in the hallways here at Good Shepherd is folks going, okay, great, but how? Like this is all super, you know, I'm hearing about how my, how today's generation of kids are super isolated. Um, I don't have any kids of my own in the home anymore. What do I do? Or Okay, I now I understand what my child is facing, but I don't know how to get started. And when I think about this conversation around child discipleship specifically, folks need to understand that getting started isn't as daunting as they may seem. So you have a vast level of experience within children's ministry in a bunch of different contexts. But if someone's someone's been hearing the series, feeling convicted, and they're trying to figure out like what the first step is, how do you help them understand how they get this process going? Well, the good news is it's really easy to get started. Um, just like if you wanted to get your kids started in a Naperville soccer program, mm -hmm. right? You find that community. You find people that are already doing it. And you ask questions and you get involved. And it's the same thing here at church. Listening to this podcast could be your first step. Maybe that's how you're getting started. You're already doing it. Nice. You're already started. The people who make those to-do lists and they like write the things yeah. they're already doing, like they're feeling really great right now. Check so, that yeah. box. Yeah, yeah see, you're, you're already started. Um, an easy way to start, come hang out at Children's Ministry check-in on a Sunday morning. It's a party back there. Mm -hmm. Like we are welcoming people. We're hugging and high-fiving and talking about what happened last week and what's going to happen this week. And, and we have that community and that fellowship. You don't have to be a member of Good Shepherd Church. You don't have to be registered in children's ministry. Just come hang out. Mm. That is a great first step. And it's an easy first step because there's a lot of people there that have taken that first step before you. Yeah, And so they welcome you with open arms. They're excited to see you. So sometimes that first step is as easy as I'm here. Mm -hmm. What do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> and that's scary for people, right? They, it, it requires be. that level of I think about, and this is every church, not just Good Shepherd, right? But there are folks who, um, I'll even think about my childhood experience. I never went to kids ministry. I went to kids ministry one time, um, didn't really like it. And then I went uh, and was part of the Kid City uh, band um, and learned how to play a couple of songs on a bass guitar. But I was, I completely missed the children's ministry experience. And my parents, in an effort to do the thing that they felt like I needed, kept me with them right? Because they saw the, what I felt like was a negative experience. Sure. But one of the things that stands out to me about the experience my own kids have had in the context of the ministry you oversee and the ministries you're a part of is you see the ways in which this goes from a kid actively, or excuse me, passively, passively seeing something to actively participating in something. You have kids who are experiencing a genuine relationship with Jesus because you have you guys are working so tirelessly to make that accessible to kids in an age appropriate way. Mm -hmm. But this parent shame, this parent guilt, this sense of, okay, I'm in this church and I see this person who's gone before me, but really I should have gone before them, right? This, we, we are our own worst enemies so often in parenting. And I'm curious if you're sitting with someone who is, who has that level of just like, man, I haven't done this right. And I'm hearing you say it's easy, but I'm still, just filled with shame about it. How do you help them understand that not only can they do this, but that this is the thing that God has called them to do? One of the things that I love to talk about with parents is the fact that no one knows their kids better than they do. Amen. You can have all the education, you can have all the experience, you can do all the things. Like, I feel like I know kids pretty well. You know, I, I can walk <laughs> yeah. into the nursery and hear a baby crying and know that they either need attention, 
a dry diaper or a full belly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If a parent walks into that nursery, it's not even a, a conversation in their head. Right. They just know, oh, my baby needs this. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's that way through your child's entire life. So whatever you're doing for your child is the right thing at the right time. Whether that's conversation, if you've got a kid like my older one who just wants to talk all the time, (laughs) (laughs) it might be constant conversation. Sure. It might be um, activities and games that you incorporate into your nightly routine. Mm -hmm. It might be teaching. You know, all kids learn at different, they learn learn in different aspects. Um, So no one is going to grow their children spiritually better than you. Yeah. And we are here to come alongside of you and resource you and equip you and support you and walk alongside of you so that you have that ability, that confidence to do that, how it best suits your child, not your neighbor's child or the other kid in children's ministry, but you, for your family specifically. That is one of my favorite parts of children's ministry is the diversity of how we can reach every child. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you went there because ultimately so much of the reason why this podcast, uh, well, the motivation from behind this podcast, I should say, and particularly in this series is I've experienced that with my kids. When my kids come in here, they feel like they belong. They feel like they're known. They feel safe. They can bring levels of what they're processing to so many different people other than my wife, Lauren and I, and they are able to, this is home for them. And every child should have that experience. And one of the great blessings of being a part of a a church like Good Shepherd is we have the resources and tools to help make that possible for every child. One of the things that stands out to me though is you're talking about check-in previously and we have outsourced other elements of our child's development. One of the reasons why a parent might expect a children's ministry uh, leader to do the discipleship is because the soccer coach does the soccer. The teacher does the education and we have created this sense of, I'm going to bring this team of specialists around my child to create the highest levels of outcome. Spirituality is different, but one of the things that stands out to me is parents aren't well educated because if they've grew up in the church, maybe they weren't discipled themselves, or maybe it's been a long time since they've been part of a church community. In a broad sense, the curiosity that brings for me is what are you hoping parents ask you about? When you talk about coming alongside a parent, w- parents have to start that conversation, but what are the best versions of that conversation? Or what are you hoping that like the parent is bringing to you so you can do the best level of helping possible? I love to know what the kids are doing and saying and thinking outside sure. of church. Sure. When they're away from 1310, what questions are they asking? Because they might not ask those questions in church. Um, They might be embarrassed if it's a quote unquote silly question Mm -hmm. that, you know, not all kids are comfortable raising their hands, Mm -hmm. but when they're laying at bed at night and it's just them and a parent saying prayers and they say, mom, you know, I was wondering, did, did Jonah really live inside of a fish for three days? Like, is that true? I want to know. Yeah that that's what they're asking. I want to know those conversations going on at home. Mm -hmm. Um, With the littles, we usually know everything that's going on at home because they can't (laughs) keep secrets. But I want to know, (laughs) I want to know (laughs) from the parent perspective, what are your kids thinking? Mm -hmm. What's in their heart? And we do that a lot, um, especially in Club 45, which is our ministry for fourth and fifth graders. That's where a lot of the big questions Mm -hmm. tend to surface. Um, And we have a QA and a with the pastor. And it is a free-for-all. It is an open mic conversation where you can ask anything, no judgment, no nothing. You can ask anything that's on your heart. And even the parents that are invited to come that night love it because they find out what their kids are thinking. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it goes both ways. Totally. So I love having those conversations with parents as to what's going on in the house that I don't see. Mm. And that can go as far as... Um, what's going on in the house that I don't see? Sure. Because if I've get a, if I've got a child who is asking a lot about heaven all of a sudden, and then to come find out 
maybe grandma is ill. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes sense. That opens up some conversations where we can walk alongside the child then and really dig into some of those deeper conversations. So it would, it's great to know what's going on in the house yeah. where we can equip you and support you and help you walk through and navigate some of those difficult conversations. What's interesting to me about it is that's the same kind of relationship I expect f- to have with my kids, teachers in school. And yet I think there's this, this gap because we, again, we create this false distance. We go, Oh, I'm supposed to know, or, Oh, Jen already knows, right? Both of those assumptions. And it creates this, this, uh, lack of potential community that ultimately is not in the best interest for our kid. Cause I think about even for my two kids, my two big kids, you know, Isaac, has walked into churches and literally said, um, it's okay, guys, I'm here. He, uh, prayed for the welcome team a couple (laughs) nights ago because it's the team he's on because our first impressions, minister LJ made him a badge, made Abigail a badge as well. Of course. Abigail processes so much more internally. You know, we are in a position where, and this will not always be this way each kid each year, but my kids, more often than not, we'll go to both services because they want to, because I'm here working and they want to stick around rather than uh, watch me drink coffee. So they will engage in both services. And Abigail at the first service is an entirely different kid than Abigail at the second, mm. because now she's heard all the questions before. And now it activates that like, oh, I want to help and oh, I want to process. And I talk about my kids, one, because they're not going to listen to this podcast because they don't want to hear it. But also <laughs> it's a helpful example to me of what you're describing of like, each kid each year in that scenario you just described what happens next after the kid is set after you find out that the kid is asking those questions what are you hopeful that you're going to be able to do and what are you hopeful that the parents able to do so for our sunday morning programming and tuesday evening programming yeah we have full autonomy as to what that looks like we edit the curriculum we write the curriculum If I know that there is a common theme happening, um, maybe there's something on social media that a lot of our fourth and fifth graders are seeing. Maybe there's an instance of bullying happening in the elementary schools that I might not be aware of because my kids are far removed from elementary. But if I'm hearing or seeing a common theme, we can actually pivot Mm. our curriculums and talk about those really big ideas in a way that it's not... Okay, little Johnny, I heard that you (laughs) were questioning or wanting to know this. You know, it's a bigger theme. And so those kids feel comfortable. Oh, this is a big idea. I'm not the only one experiencing this or I'm not the only one thinking this. Yeah. So it's a it's a wonderful process that we have in that we can pivot and tweak and edit as we go so that we are paying attention to those common themes. And then if it does get very specific, we can sit down with that family even. Um, And, you know, something that you said reminded me of a conversation that happened not too long ago where a child in our ministry heard something completely different that was actually being said. Okay. They go home and say, hey, mom, this is what I heard. And mom called me and said, why was that said? (laughs) You know, <laughs> yeah. and it gave me the opportunity to say, actually, this is what we talked sure. about. And we were able to, to walk with that family yeah. and unpack an idea that, you know, the Bible is not a bunch of fairy tales, but actually true stories yep. breathed by God. Yep. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful back and forth. I love that that mom called. Yes, me Be- too. Yeah. Because I would have never known yeah. that child would have believed. Uh-huh that the Bible is a fairy tale, Mm -hmm. never, never questioned it because that's what their teacher told them. And we're taught to believe our teachers, but they went home and, and questioned it. And I'm so glad they did. And it turned out to be a beautiful conversation between two adults, an adult, a child, a parent and a child, like all of these things just snowballed from that one situation that is now a a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's great. Mm Mm-hmm. So one of the things that stands out to me about the unique part about child discipleship and compared to other parts of the development of our kids is it's not linear. 
often, I guess I should say. Mm -hmm. Ooh. I'm able to look at my kids' academic performance and understand, okay, if they're doing this by around this time, if they're doing this around this time, they're generally tracking in the right direction. Spiritual formation, it's a lot harder to do that. What I'm curious about is the, you know, your kids are in the early parts of college, the late part of high school. Like what I'm curious about is as you look back at their child development, like are you able to identify some of these mile markers, some of these ways where you go like, oh, we're, we're generally heading in the right direction because sure. I think if I'm a new parent to this conversation, those are the kinds of things I want to look for with the appropriate qualif qualification that you just started of every kid is different. Sure, sure. So a perfect example is not too long ago on a Sunday morning, um, I, I checked in a family, regular, regular family, and they brought a friend. Great. Fantastic. Well, what I found out was they had planned a sleepover for Friday night. And the daughter that comes to church said, can we do the sleepover on Saturday so that she can come to church with us the next morning? Oh, that's awesome. It was awesome. That's great. And that is a concrete, like that's a very obvious, yep. we're headed in the right direction when our kids want that for their friends. Sure. Right. When, when you have something wonderful in your life and you have someone wonderful in your life and you want to merge those two things together, we get a lot of friends at club 45. We get a lot of friends at sparks. Um, it's a beautiful thing. So those are a little more obvious. Yeah. Um, the not so obvious, the more abstract ideas when you get a little bit older and you, you mentioned like the kids are different. So my daughter is going into ministry. Mm -hmm. She knew in seventh grade she was going to be called to be a pastor. So we can talk to her about discipleship. Sure. And we can talk to her about discernment processes and very um, religious <laughs> yeah. speaking sure. ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My son, on the other hand, he doesn't... Uh, he doesn't glean from that language. Yeah, that makes right? sense. Right. So instead of being discerned to a leadership position as Megan was, he was chosen to be the captain of his sports team. Sure. But that is a beautiful opportunity for us to engage in conversation as to what that leadership position means. It's a great example. Yes. Yes. Um, so so from that, we can we can separate the two kids, giving them the same idea. And in turn, they are showing us that they are, as you said, on the right path in that um, Bradley is talking to his friends about, hey, Sunday night, let's the team, because he's team captain, so it's all about the team, let's do this and then head over to Ignite where we can play nine square. Because yep. he knows he's talking to athletes. Yep. He knows he's going to um, engage in their abilities. Nice. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, he's bringing him to church because yep. this is his comfort zone. It's his safe space. It's yep. where he wants to be. And it's that merging what the, the wonderful thing in my life to the wonderful person in my life. And it's bringing it all together. That's so great. I love the, I love that example for a bunch of reasons, because I think again, so often we make this more complicated than we need to with parents. And by figuring out the type of literal language that's leading to the same place, the being a pastor is being a leader, being captain of a team is, is being a leader. You have, they're in the same arenas, mm -hmm. but knowing the, taking the time, you and Tom taking the time to understand the differences on what's going to work for your kid is what has yielded that kind of fruit. And I, I love that because I think it's the kind of thing that it activates for parents. Oh, the time is the thing that I have. It may not feel that way. Days are days are long, years are right, short, right? right? But like we all have this understanding of I have the most time with my kids as, as possible because often it is uh, I have the most time with my kids, right? Like <laughs> and both get both uh, gets to be true. One of the interesting things for me thinking about you know for those who are who are still listening with us like there's this sense that I think a lot of parents carry or even a lot of grandparents carry of how, man, this is different than when I was a kid. You know, if I'm someone who listened or who's listening, who grew up in a like kids are better seen, but not heard type of mm -hmm. uh, environment, all of what we're describing is an entirely different universe than that. What I'm curious about, because you've spent so much of your, of your life devoted to kids and a variety of contexts. How have you seen that 
this conversation shift because my hope here is that you folks understand that if I've said this, I've said this a bunch, but like if you're looking at your kid and going like, man, you are from a different planet. Mm-hmm. It's cause they are right. And right. The, the, exactly. how have you seen that shift <laughs> through your career? Not only are the kids from a different planet, we live on a different planet. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we'll Even I've been in children's ministry for 18 years. My oldest is 19 years old. The shift in 18 or 19 years is incredible. We are talking to our elementary students about mental health, mm. about identity. Yeah. I've got elementary students talking to me about politics. <laughs> They should not even know about politics at that point. The fact that their parents yeah. have a sign in their front yard, mm-hmm. one one way or the other, um, they think that they are equipped to talk about politics. Sure. Right? So conversations have shifted across the spectrum mm-hmm. in how we talk to the kids and what we're talking to them about. When I was going to Sunday school um, 40 plus years ago, I would go to Sunday school and I would talk about Bible stories, period. Mm-hmm. We, we learned the Bible stories. We memorized scripture and that was it. And on Sunday mornings, we're still talking about those Bible stories and those scripture passages, but the kids are already equating the relevancy of that to their world today. Sure, They are so inundated with information and overload that should be, in my opinion, should be well beyond their years. Yeah. You know, they they said our kids are getting older much younger. Yeah. And there's so much truth to that. And I think as responsible adults, we can't ignore that. Mm -hmm. We have to encourage that because they are real issues that our kids are dealing with. And we can't live in denial. We can't pretend that that's not happening. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the conversations are evolving daily yeah. anymore and you just got to go with it you gotta you gotta <laughs> roll with it you gotta <laughs> figure yeah, it yeah exactly really i mean it it's very cliche to say you just figure it out mm-hmm. um but there is some truth to that mm-hmm. and it's okay to say i don't have an answer in this moment i don't know what to say mm-hmm but let's figure it out. Let's talk through it. Let's invite other people to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, one of my my favorite ideas is to invite three people into your world. Someone who is walking the same path as you. So in, in the same chapter of life, they're doing the same thing. They have kids the same age, whatever that looks like. Someone who is a step ahead of you, Mm -hmm. right? Who has made the mistakes, who has maybe done some things right that can can Mm -hmm. help you along the way. And then eventually somebody behind you that you can invite alongside of you to share all of your mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Goes both ways. Um, So I think it's really important to have those three people in your life who have had the conversations who are having the conversations and who will have the conversations. That's so good. In the very near future. That's so good because it, it invites this kind of, um, it changes cycles. It creates this space where I think for so many adults who listen, the conversation around discipleship of kids, discipleship of students, club 45, discipleship of preteens, it feels so challenging because they themselves never experienced it. Mm-hmm. Um, And by the simplicity of what you're describing, it makes that so much more accessible for folks to go like, okay, I'm hearing Jen say this and I can think of the person ahead of me, the person next to me, and probably the person who will be coming up, um, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, because we already know those people. We're already in relationship with those people and it doesn't have to be uh, overly complicated. Here's where I want to wrap things up. So one of the things that, folks who are still listening are likely looking for is how to keep this going. Right. Mm -hmm. We, as a church, we, we, we dedicated time to this series and our hope in doing this is not that this stops here, right? We don't want this to be this thing where they go like, man, that was a cool series about kids. They did at some point in the, in the past. (laughs) Right. What I'm curious about are like, I want to talk about like on the ground type of stuff on the ground resources on the ground, next steps, ways to get involved. So you just talked about, you know, find your three people. Mm -hmm. 
what are some other kind of broad resources or trusted folks that you're like, man, if a parent is asking a question, I'm constantly referring them to this or what have you. Mm -hmm. Um, again, that's not as easy as it sounds sure. because, because every family looks different, yeah, right. And every family works differently. So it's such a broad range of people. Yeah. You might have friends, family, you might have that close community that you can go to for anything. You might have just moved across the world and feel completely alone. I would challenge you to get involved as soon as possible in a faith community. Sure. And you will be amazed at how quickly your faith community can become family. I think it's really important to have different people speak to your children. Mm -hmm. um, some of my favorite people in the world are, kid, are people that my kids have met that I would never have known. Mm -hmm. They're small group leaders. They're Sparks leaders. Um, people that think, you know, my when my daughter was little, an older woman came up and said, well, you are the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. And that sparked a beautiful relationship, an intergenerational relationship, just because. From that simple compliment. Because yeah. Megan had curly hair, whatever the case may be. <laughs> uh, but I was able to latch on yep. to that relationship. And that woman is still a part of Megan's life. Love it's that. a beautiful thing. Love that. So it's not always cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. It's not always a comfort zone that you can go to this one person, your, you know, your pastor or your teacher or whatever, whatever that mm -hmm. may be. Um, so I would encourage everyone to just look beyond the walls of 1310, look beyond the walls of your home, get to know people, get to get part of that community. Even if it is the soccer team, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's outside of the church and then you have the opportunity to disciple them, bring them into your world. Yep. So it's a, a symbiotic relationship, if you will, mm -hmm. um, the back and forth. Love it. Yeah, I think it's, I'm really glad you answered that question that way because the first thing that I think people wind up looking for is, man, give me a podcast, give me a book, give me an education on this. Mm. And by going to a relationship, you are going to folks who have, who have lived these experiences are living these experiences and the books and the podcasts and the things of that will come, mm -hmm. but then they're not mm -hmm. being informed by uh, the internet. They're being informed by your kid because they're being informed by the relationship that those folks have. Yep. I want to make sure you have last word here. So the, the broad way I want to ask this question is things we haven't talked about in the context of this series, but also just like leaving folks for still listening and encouragement on that. They are equipped to do this. So what are, if I'm listening to this and I'm like, okay, I, I, I think so. This conversation has moved me from I can't to maybe I can. How do we move them to all the way into that I can bucket? I promise you, you can. I, I cross my heart. Um, it can be as simple as praying with your child. And one of the things that I love to teach my young preteens is that prayer should not be intimidating. You don't have to use fancy words. You don't have to be in a certain posture or in a specific place. Prayer is a conversation. Mm. Just like you and I are having, prayer is a conversation with God. Pray with your kids. Tell them what's going on. Tell God what's going on in your lives. He already knows. Yeah. It's just a matter of you saying it out loud. That is the simplest way to bring your kids into that relationship with God. Uh, but what I want to leave you with is inherited faith versus authentic faith. And, and the reason I think that's so important in this conversation is because anyone who has grown up with a church background, whether you went once a year or 52 times a year plus, uh, we start with an inherited faith, right? Our parents tell us to believe in God, so we believe in God. They tell us the Bible stories, so we believe the Bible stories. And there comes a point in time, and this goes back to every kid is different and the way they think and the way they do, there comes a point in time where that inherited faith becomes their own authentic faith. Mm. And it's really important to keep that line of communication open. Mm. And whether you are physically, literally speaking, you know, quote unquote, religious terms is irrelevant. The fact that you're having these conversations with your kids and they are being heard will naturally lead 
to that next conversation of religion and faith sharing and witnessing and and bringing God into those conversations. But you have to start with honesty and transparency and the ability to say what's on your mind. And that's not always easy because what's on a kid's mind <laughs> comes out <laughs> um, very uh, directly, we'll yeah. say. That's a good mm-hmm. word to use. Mm-hmm. Kids are very direct. Um, but that is a great opportunity for you to bring God into that conversation. And that's how you, their authentic faith begins to build that foundation. Thank you for listening to the Encounter Faith Podcast. This podcast is a service of G. Shep Productions from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Naperville, Illinois. All rights reserved. If you're in the area, we'd love to meet you on a Sunday morning at our 9 a.m. or 1045 services. At Good Shepherd, we are inviting everyone to walk together in the calling of Christ for a life of eternal impact. This podcast is produced and hosted by me, Ross Cochran. And our theme song is Wake the Earth by 1111 Worship. Thank you for listening. We'll talk again soon. We'll talk again soon.